So, good evening. I'm Tatiana Bazzichelli, curator of Transmediale Festival, and I have with me Katrin Jacobs, that has also been uh, curating uh, together the Will You Be My Treasure stream. And so this is the, actually the last panel of the stream and also the last panel of the Transmediale conferences uh, in 2014. So we are really pleased to be here and uh, uh, actually end the uh, conference uh, program with the fantastic keynote, uh, Sputnik. I would really ask you to make a big applause for her. And, uh, So I would like just to give a bit of the context of the Will You Be My Treasure stream that so probably many of you have been already following and enjoying with a lot of pleasure, I hope. And so this is a stream that uh, me, Catherine Jacobs and Francesco Warbert Macarone Palmieri that is sitting over there uh, conceptualized, conceptualized together and so it's like one year that we are working on this thing and I think that uh, uh, I'm personally really proud of the result. I think it has been really interesting uh, for the third year already uh, to bring uh, into Transmediale a discourse related to body politics, sexuality, with a critical perspective also on artistic practices. And uh, so uh, this is also what we are going to do this night. Uh, first, I want to say also, I want to introduce properly Catherine for the people that uh, maybe have not been yet to the other events. And she is an associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and also she is researching on pornography, censorship, and media activism in China. And uh, so, uh, her last uh, book, she already wrote, wrote three books, but the last one that uh, was also available in these days is People's Pornography, Sex and Surveillance on the Chinese Internet. And uh, we also remember in the second day we had a really interesting panel related to this topic and uh, the activism uh, and sex in China. And uh, uh, so, but today we are here to introduce Sputnik and would like to say that I'm really pleased to conclude uh, the conference with this uh, topic because I think that we have been reflecting uh, many times on the afterglow of digital culture and there have been a lot of reflection bringing together hackers, artists, whistleblowers uh, and activists uh, and we have been claimed often that the revolution is over but we have also been claimed that uh, um, inside the afterglow there is always a sparkling light uh, of pink color that uh, is illuminating probably new practices to come and I think uh, for sure the new practices to come is also what Sputniko is doing uh, because uh, she has a really interesting approach uh, I think Katrin will go a bit more in depth on that but uh, uh, she is uh, really uh, reflecting on the idea of uh, gender issues combined with the programming skills, artistic imagination and the playful attitude towards sexualities. So, for example, what she does, she builds up really interesting machines and uh, that she is going to present uh, and Catherine is going to <laughs> go more in depth about that. And uh, I just would like to... Uh, uh, point out that uh, what I find also interesting and has been also informing a lot the Will You Be My Treasure stream is that sexuality could be considered as a, a tool for um, empowering people so as not uh, to be considered something that is actually dismissing uh, you know women role but it's something that could actually empower women role and not only women I mean we have been see, uh, seeing many other people speaking about that queer people, uh, men women and whatever sexuality you decide to have. And uh, so this night we are speaking about the radical future that are inspired from the Japanese character Doraemon, that is the robot that pulls out of its pocket gadgets coming from the 22nd century. And so uh, Sputnik will show uh, as, uh, as a radical design machine uh, could be really interesting to reveal playfully uh, controversial context of mainstream environment and entertainment and at the same time also help us to reflect with a really uh, imaginative perspective on the discourse of feminism and body politics. Now I leave the word to Katrin. So hi everyone. I want to say a few more words about Sputniko! Exclamation mark. 
Uh, Sputniko <laughs> is a well-known artist and designer. Uh, she has exhibited in major galleries and museums such as the Mo MoMA in New York City, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. She also works as assistant professor in MIT's Media Lab. She has a degree in design interactions from the Royal College of Art in London. She's a, a mathematician, a computer scientist who's familiar with very complex programming languages. Yet she uses her feminist and feminine artistic and humorous interventions in these worlds of robotics and artificial intelligence. She's influenced by other artists and performers, such as Laurie Anderson and Miranda July. And I also detect in her work similarities uh, to the work of early cyber feminist artists, such as Venus Matrix. Today, she will enlighten us with an overview of her ideas and works that question traditional modules of artificial intelligence and design, and also offer do radical alternatives. When I first met Sputnik on Skype, she explained that besides being an artist and professor, she's deeply immersed in social media debates, um, and that her works and views can solicit anger and hatred. A few weeks ago, she criticized the front cover of an academic international journal on artificial intelligence, which depicted a female robot who, men, um, a female robot who is a servant in the household and who is sweeping the floor. This image was not meant to be a joke, but was a remnant of patriarchal thinking within this field of science. While it may seem awkward to us that an academic journal can have such a sexist, sexist image on the front cover, Sputniko was attacked badly online for stating the obvious. And indeed, when this kind of hate campaign or hate speech against an outspoken female artist comes to light, we could also wonder how this relates to our theme of afterglow. Or has the internet ever been really a space where radical feminist art or subversive uh, erotic arts can glow without being viciously attacked. Uh, so I think Sputnik's works are vital because they puncture ancient and old school templates of female etiquette and female companionship that are still taken for granted by the engineers of post-human forms the mostly male creators of humanoids and geminoids who in their schooling skipped seminars on body art and cyber feminist thought. So it's very nice to have Sputniko with us today uh, to show us two radical ways of doing it that are highly influenced by Japanese culture and eroticism, but also take the Japanese industries of robotics and super cute to a level beyond. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, hi there. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'd really like to thank Transmediale for inviting me all the way here from Boston. It's, you know, uh, to give me such a fantastic opportunity. Thank you so much. So, Sputniko is not really my real name. It's an artist's name I work with. And like um, Katrin said, I studied mathematics and computer science in my undergraduate studies, but then I went on to study design interactions at Royal College of Art in London to do a master's. And after I graduated, I went to Japan for three years to be an independent artist. And then um, last year, in November, I moved to the United States to be an assistant professor at MIT Media Lab to start the new um, design fictions group. So, in short, what I do is um, I like making objects that facilitate discussions about social, cultural implications of technology on everyday life. And as a mu musician, I like, I like to make songs about them, make music videos about them, and post them up on YouTube to further open up this discussion outside of the traditional museum and gallery settings. So, this talk is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to talk through some of my key ideas behind my works, and then I'm going to show you some of my projects. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about what this word, the radical futures, actually mean. 
And um, at the very end, there's a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. So is that OK? Cool. <laughs> it's always nerve wracking. OK, so, so um, I'm going to talk about some ideas behind my work. So imagining and discussing futures. So I said that I like making sort of machines, robots that facilitate discussions about the impact of technology on our everyday life. And I like to imagine alternative futures, how the world could be. And um, this is what uh, Professor Anthony Dunn at Royal College of Art often says, is that you know, we use the word could, not should, because it's not a moralistic thing of seeing the world. It's about asking questions, you know, what if the world is like this? What if we change the current system to something like that? And get a discussion going around that. And the reason why discussions are so important to me is that a preferable future is different for everyone. You know, a preferable future for me, for you, someone in Japan, Germany, United States, China, big corporations, small businesses, they're all completely different. And sometimes it's effective to illustrate these um, different possible future scenarios, like both preferable and unpreferable, to stimulate the minds and you know, start questioning the world around you and get a discussion going. So you have a more sort of solid picture of what a preferable future you want. And another thing I'm very interested in is the idea of the new popular. And I have a feeling that the word popular is not a very popular word among some artists and critics, I think. And I kind of understand that because the word popular has this sort of notion of being kind of commercial, uncritical, or over-stereotyped, superficial. You know, and maybe, you know, that was really the case when media was very, very centralized, you know, such as television, radio, magazine, you know, very few people had access to these centralized media to spread different kinds of ideas. But after the digital revolution, media is becoming increasingly more decentralized. And we have the social media now to speak out, spread ideas, and even gather a team of following. So I think, you know, maybe, why can't we use this language of popular to spread more progressive and challenging ideas, especially if we want more discussion happening, more minds stimulated, and, you know, change more of the world because, you know, if more minds are changed, the world that comes out from those minds would be different. So I'm very interested in this new popular in the social media age. Also, in my work, I really heavily use social media to recruit people into my production team. And this was very helpful for me, especially as a starting artist with very little budget and especially when I was a student. And it's just amazing how many talented people out there are willing to help you if you have, you know, if you post an idea on Twitter or on Facebook. And also, even now, um, I started getting more sponsorship for my new works, but still, half of my production team are professional, but the other half, I go on Twitter and recruit people who want to help. So it's, I think there's a new way of working emerging among artists. And also, being a math student who was inspired to do more music and arts, well, Laurie Anderson, artists like Laurie Anderson and Miranda July, they had very big impact on me when I was a math student. And a big reason is that, you know, their works didn't just sit inside a small arts community. You know, they had different mediums like film, concerts, music. So that's why their works reached me, even though I was a student studying maths. You know, I wasn't really interested so much into art so much then. And their works really inspired me. So it's really important for me that my works are out there in YouTube or the popular medium. So maybe middle school girls, high school girls, or you know, not just girls, girls and boys, college students see my work and be sort of inspired from them. So now I'm going to start talking about my projects. 
So this is the first project I'm going to talk about. It's called the menstruation machine. So when I was making this project, I was starting to wonder, you know, what if technology can be used to dress up a biological function onto yourself? So in this project, it features this character, fictional character, Takashi, who is a transvestite man who likes to dress up as a woman through fashion or makeup. But he's very unsatisfied with that, you know? And he really wants to fulfill, fulfill his desire to dress up as a woman biologically by experiencing menstruation so maybe he can truly understand what it feels like to be a woman. So he builds this machine which he's wearing here. And on the machine, I actually built this machine with the advice of um, Professor Jan Brozens at Imperial College, who's an expert on fertility and menstruation. And he told me everything about menstruation, like the hormonal changes, pain, and all this instability women go through. He probably knew a lot more about menstruation than I did. And using his advice, so this device, it's got electrodes on the stomach that gives a very dull pain using these electrical signals. And at the back, there's a tank that stores 80 milliliters of blood that will flow through between his legs over the five-day period. So I build this machine, but as Sputniko, I'm a musician, I don't end there. I write a pop song about this machine and about this character. And I also directed a music video about the whole story of him going out in Tokyo wearing this machine. And when I made this work, I was a student and I had absolutely no money. So I, actually, I had a thousand dollars which I earned through programming which is a lot for students, but not so much to make a new film. So I went on Twitter and said, hey, I have an idea. I built this machine that allows men to experience menstruation, and I want to shoot this music video. Can someone come and help me with it? So I managed to get a video director, lighting, stylist, hair and makeup. I gathered a team of 20 people in Tokyo, and after one week, this is a video that we managed to shoot. So I'm going to show you the video. Oops.
you. <laughs> so when I posted this video up on YouTube, that was, this was part of my graduation project from Royal College of Art in 2010. Uh, it got exhibited later in uh, New York MoMA, a Museum of Contemporary Art, in quite a very high art setting. But what was very interesting for me about this video is as soon as I posted it up on YouTube, it went so viral online. It had 200,000 views in just one week. It got blocked on Wired, Gizmodo, Boing Boing, all over the cyberspace. And also it was partly because there were some confusions with the blogger that I was actually a Japanese guy who really wanted to experience menstruation. You know, this is crazy guy, Sputnik girl. Who, and there seems to be still a confusion that I'm actually a guy. And if you see me today, I am not really a guy. Maybe I used to, be, I don't know. But if you could tweet that I'm a female artist, that would be great. But so online, there was so much talk, confusion. And, you know, on the YouTube video, there were these comments underneath the video. And obviously not all of them are extremely intellectual comments, but there would be high school boys saying, this guy's crazy, what is he thinking, modifying gender, I don't get it. Or there will be a college girl, girl saying, you know, I, I actually appreciate this guy Sputnikov's attempt to understand what it feels like to be a woman. You know, maybe the world is going to be a more peaceful place if men experience menstruation. So there are these interesting discussions going on in YouTube comments that you would not really see inside just New York MoMA or Museum of Contemporary Art. So to me, this work wasn't just about the video or the machine itself. The whole YouTube comments, Facebook comments, made the project a lot more interesting and rich for me. So now I'm going to move on to the next project. And it's called Crobot Jenny. So Crobot Jenny here, I was wondering, you know, what if, you know, maybe how can we use simple technology to interact with the animals in an urban environment in a more interesting and engaging ways? So when I was making this project, I think maybe it was too much social media overload, you know, tweeting and getting tweets. I was getting a bit bored of talking with humans. So I thought, OK, if I'm bored with talking with other human beings, why don't I start talking with other animals? So I started doing research on how to talk with animals, animal communication and interaction. And I found out that crows had a very high intelligence and a very complex language system. So I found that um, there were crow specialists in Cambridge University and also University of Utsunomiya in Japan. So I visited these crow specialists and I said, you know, I want to talk to crows because I heard they're really smart. And, and they gave me this, um, they were really nice people and they gave me this whole bunch of um, different crow calls. So crow words saying things like, oh, I'm hungry or, you know, oh, I'm in danger, so please come help me, or, oh, like, you know, there's enemy here, so we should fly away. And there are all these different crow calls that they had from their research. So I, I asked them, can I have these crow calls? And I installed these crow calls into this crow-shaped robot. And I designed the robot so that if I press a button, I can speak a crow speak at a crow. And I'm going to show you a video of me testing this crowbar in London. And one thing I want to tell you is that crows in Britain and crows in the United States and Japan, apparently they all speak different languages. It's really, it, it was really interesting. So this crowbot works in London, but if I want to bring it to Japan, I need to install the Japanese crow words instead. So. So that's me testing the crowbot, and this is the real crow. And my crowbot is saying, ah, 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 three times. And that means, yo, what's up, in <laughs> British crow speak. And I'm saying this a few times to this real crow, and after a while, the real crow starts responding back. So I'm going to show you. So you, you hear me talking to this crow. 
So this is really nice. Could you put the volume up, okay? Still a student. Did you hear that? It's responding to my call. So I try again. So at this point, the crow is starting to get worried that I'm saying, yo, what's up, yo, what's up, so many times. And I started saying something else. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, but, you know, the crow gets a little suspicious and gets a little quiet and flies away. He's showing us, let's follow him. So, I was so excited when I managed to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a crow. You know, it's like my my robot works. I'm having a conversation with a crow, another animal species. So I show this video to the crow specialists, and they were very, very happy about the result too. And again, I'm Sputniko, so I don't end there. I want to write music about this. I want to create a story about this whole robot. So I created a fiction. This character. Jenny, who feels quite insecure about talking to other, you know, friends in her school. So she goes into this science lab, starts reading papers, and builds this crowbot on her own in an attempt to be actually talk to crows in her garden and maybe possibly make friends with them. So I'm going to show you the video, which is here.
正解者ねえのかへえほんとかはい。You know, gigantic leaps for the humankind through super DIY projects out of their personal romantic wish. So, Selena here, she is a high school girl who loves, loves the space, and she really, really wants to go to the moon. And also because she has this big crush On Lunar Girl, she is a superhero fighting evil on the surface of the moon with big high heel shoes. So, Selena, wanting to be like Lunar Girl, she wants to go to the moon, but you know, she can't go now, and she, she really wants to go, and she's so frustrated that she can't go herself now that she goes online, finds everything she can find on the internet to create this DIY moon rover. That would go around the surface of the moon. And this moon rover has tires that leave these high heel female footprints on the surface of the moon as it goes around. So she's, she creates this moon rover, launches it into the moon as a big statement. She wants to go, she wants to walk on the surface of the moon. And actually, it's a bit of a satirical thing because I think women should actually be going up there. But Selena, because She really wants to go and she can't go now. She makes this object as a big I'm gonna go statement. And this project was actually,、um, I created a prototype moon rover machine that would actually might be able to go on the moon surface and leave these high heel footprints. And when I actually told、uh, people at NASA, they have.、Uh, Organization called University Space Research Association about this idea. They were very happy for me,、uh, for, them to, for me to come to visit the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, to meet different people like engineers, astronauts, and、um, to discuss about the design of this m o o n rover, which was a very interesting experience for me. And also, I was very much inspired by this project. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, a 13 year old girl in California launched a Hello Kitty into space for her summer project. If you search Hello Kitty space on YouTube, you find it. So she's like Selena. She went online and found all this information about how to create this balloon and how to use GoPro to launch her favorite Hello Kitty into space and film it from outer space. So, seeing someone like her, a 13 year old girl, I thought, you know, maybe these amazing, you know, gigantic steps for humankind might be made by a high school student's summer project, maybe. So, next, again, I wrote a song about Selena's story and I directed a music video and posted it up on YouTube. So, now that's, this is going to be the video.
Thank you. <laughs> so, I showed you more of a very solo Sputnikle style project, but I also work with more open Sputnikle directed community projects, and this is one of them. So, this is called Adachi Hip Hop Project, and I'm actually at the back holding this red cone, you know, uh, with the rappers in Adachi. So this project is basically, Arachi is an area in Tokyo which has the highest rate of um, poverty and street crime. And Adachi Council started investing more in the arts and culture program to get the youth in Adachi uh, away from street crimes and sort of like, sort of get more um, involved in the cultures and sort of like the neighborhood a lot more. And also Adachi, like more than 40% of the households in Adachi are getting governmental support to pay the school fee for the kids. And there, it's an area which has all these various problems. So Adachi Council, when they were trying to plan the arts program, they contacted me because they were telling me that they were struggling to get the audience between the age of 15 and 25 to come to the events. And they thought that you know, they asked me, like, how can we get more young people involved in the events? So, and I looked at the archive of programs done by Adachi Council, and I found out that you know they were having like John Cage concerts or extremely fine art exhibitions in Adachi. And I think John Cage is a really cool guy, and I like his work, but I thought, you know, no wonder these teenagers didn't really feel like they were part of this thing. So, okay, so I started doing some research about Adachi and the culture there, and I found that Adachi had a very, very rich hip-hop community. So there were these rappers, teenage rappers, young rappers, rapping about their own neighborhood or their everyday problems, and they were very, very good. So I told Adachi Council, you know, I don't want to bring arts and culture from outside to Adachi. There are these artists living in Adachi, and I want to work with them and create an event that's only in Adachi. And I said that, you know, Actually, there are these rappers, very talented rappers here, and I want to organize a bus tour that goes around Adachi, and instead of having these bus guys, you know, guiding through Adachi, I'm going to get these rappers rap about their own favorite neighborhood on this bus tour. And Adachi Council, when they heard that, they were like, really? Like, you're going to do a bus tour? But I was like, okay, trust me, I'm going to try to contact them and, you know, we're going to try to make this happen. So I went on Twitter and asked for people to introduce me to these hip-hop artists living in Anachi. And I was very lucky because I got in touch with um, the boss of the hip-hop community in Anachi. And this boss is actually a son of a Japanese sweet shop factory in Anachi. So apparently, like, these rappers would come like every week to this sweet shop factory to do rehearsals and practice of their um, of their lives gigs. So the first time I met the rappers, it was in the factory, this Japanese sweet shop factory, and on the wall it would be like wash your hands or you know let's make good sweets, and there are these guys there doing the practices. So when I first met them. It was very, very difficult because, you know, I, I would suddenly appear and they were like, who are you? And I'm like, uh, actually, I'm an artist. I just came back from London. I want to create this bus tour around that edgy. Don't you think it's going to be exciting? And these guys are like, what, like, there's nothing in Adachi to guys, you know, why do you want to have a bus tour? So it was so difficult. but. You know, over the course of four months, I tried to get to know the people, and we would drive around Adachi, and they would tell me like the favorite places they go, and bit by bit, I built a relationship with them, and actually managed to create this bus store that goes around the area. And when we actually announced we we're going to do this event, it, the event was so successful. So 200 seats on the bus sold out in two hours. 
and over 500 people came to the two days of concerts. So I'm going to show you a video of this um, bus store that we actually made it happen. It's um. Yeah. So we made the bus very plainly, and these are the rappers I worked with. They're like 18-year-old, 19-year-old kids. And so this skateboard park was an interesting place in the bus tour because this skateboard park didn't really, wasn't supposed to really exist in Adachi. The skateboard park was made illegally by people by bringing in like sofas, cones, or making like a concrete kind of place to walk around, do the skates. So, Adachi Council didn't really want me to stop at this skateboard park. But, you know, the skateboard park had a very important place in these, these um, rappers, so I asked Adachi Council, like, please, like, we need to stop there, you know, this is where, this is really important for the tour. And the Adachi Council told me, okay, if you really want to stop there, you have to pretend that there's someone with a stomachache every time. <laughs> So, in the bus tour, we always had to get one guy saying, Hey, 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 I have a stomachache, we need to stop the bus. So we stopped the bus, and then we're going to go skating a little bit, and come back to the bus, and get on the tour. So there were some of these strange things we had to work out with the Japanese bureaucratic system, because we had to work with the Adachi Council. But it was a very interesting experience. And also, like, I did my very first rap of my life in my concert. I'm going to show you a snippet of it. And this was really scary, but this is me rapping. <laughs> <laughs> my first oh thanks I, it was so scary but then you know the rappers really helped me to write the lyrics and practice and they were telling me you know the lyrics are not good enough and you know I went over it again and again and I managed to do this and it was really scary but a great experience and this event was so successful that this happened in 2012, but they did another one in 2013, just last month. And what was great was that, you know, by that time I was not in Japan anymore, I moved to the United States. But these guys, independently, without me being in Japan, they organized the event with the Adachi Council. And that was great because that was the intention I had. I, I wanted to really stimulate the creative youth scene in Adachi. I didn't want to just bring an artwork outside into Adachi. I wanted to have the actual scene um, get really energized. And that's what actually happened. So they're going to do another, another Adachi hip hop project next year too. And we're even talking about collaborating with um, people abroad, so I'm in touch with um, the hip-hop community in Detroit because I did a lecture in the University of Michigan. So these rappers are so excited and I think this is how, um, it's just a great way of um, doing community projects, is just working with people within the community. So finally, after talking about this Anachi hip-hop project, finally I'm going to talk about Doraemon. So, Oops, sorry. So Doraemon here is, oh no, it's not playing. Oh, really? Uh-oh, is my computer crashing? <laughs> I hope not. Well, if it's crashing, I'm going to talk over it. So Doraemon here is, um, oh, okay. I'm going to reopen it. So. Doraemon here is an anime series of a blue uh, robotic cat that brings out a future invention from his pocket every week. And it's a massively, massively popular anime series. And um, I can't find 
Uh, sorry. Okay, that's gonna. Great. Is that gonna play? Yes. So I'm gonna have no sound. So it's a massively popular anime series in uh, Japan, China, Indonesia, India, Spain, and it's been going on from 1970s. So basically, he brings out a future invention from his pocket, and that invention creates all sorts of problems that makes children think about, you know, moral issues, ethical issues, or maybe environmental problems. And I have a big respect for Doraemon because, you know, earlier I mentioned that I'm interested in talking about more critical, progressive issues in a more popular language, and he really does it, I think. So then I started calling my own practice Doradical, and that's a mixture of Doraemon and radical and critical all put together, Doradical. Because Personally, I like to make works that facilitate discussion, stimulate discussion about social, cultural implications of technology. But then, I want to use more, a more popular medium to captivate a larger, popular audience to get more people engaged in the discussion. And as the author uh, Stephen Duncan, the author of Dream Politic, puts it, he says that a dream that no one follows is an empty dream. And I really believe in that too, and I feel that a question that no one asks is an empty question, a discussion that no one follows is an empty discussion. And especially now, we have the tool free and available to us to spread ideas and questions and effectively get more people involved in our questions. You know, I see like maybe the future, well, future at least for Sputniko, is Doradical. And I would love to end this lecture on the radical future in a positive way like this. You know, ah, oh, the future is the radical. We can spread so many ideas to the world. But I'm going to talk about the afterglow of the radical future that I experienced very recently. It only happened three weeks ago. So, the radical futures, yes. We live in a time where artists can spread ideas, questions so freely to so many people, so easily, but then that means that actually the other way happens. You know, people, anonymous people with very bad intentions could directly attack and threaten and insult artists in a way that never happened 15 years ago. And I really experienced this recently in this uh, controversy I was in, involved in with the Artificial Intelligence Society's uh, front cover. So this is a cover image of an academic journal in Japan for artificial intelligence. And as you can see, it's a female robot tied to a cable with a broomstick, and she is cleaning the house. And this was voted as the number one choice in Artificial Intelligence Society, and it's supposed to show the possible future of artificial intelligence. So in my Twitter, I have 40,000 followers. I thought, you know, isn't this a little inappropriate for an academic journal cover? What would female scientists feel? Now, it's, it kind of makes them feel like their colleagues want to build these you know, amazing female servant robots. You know, don't they need to really think that it's a bit strange that this is chosen as a number one choice? And when I made this opinion, it was a casual opinion. I always do this on Twitter. I always voice what I think. And I wasn't thinking that a massive, massive, massive controversial discussion happened from this tweet. So when I made this tweet, I got support from academics and intellectuals, and they were on my side. But I didn't realize that there was so much uh, momentum of anti-feminist sentiments online. So for two weeks after I made this comment, and it's still happening now a little bit, I was getting hundreds and thousands of hate tweets thrown at me saying that I am an overreacting, idiotic feminist. This is nothing to be raising an issue about. 
And it was not a nice thing to wake up to every morning. So I was getting um, rape threats. Some of them were giving me rape threats, death threats. And uh, I got married in December. And I had wedding photos. And some of these anonymous people exposed my private wedding photos, spread it on the internet, and they were writing so many horrible things about me. Not just my belief, but how I look, my family, my friends, my love life. And it was terrible. So the whole thing got out of hand, and the Asahi newspaper made an article on the national news. And then it went to the BBC News, who made an article. And then it went, even went to the German paper, Die Spiegel, about this article, just from my tweet. And the whole discussion was very interesting. And I think it had positive outputs, because it made Japanese academics realize that it could be an issue to portray such an image like that on their cover, you know, a female robot cleaning your house. Maybe there's something to really reflect on, think about. And also the academic journal made an apology on their website. And they're going to release the next issue. They're going to do an issue on gender and robotics. So they're going to have a whole issue thinking about gender and robotics. And I also made, yeah, it's a great thing. <laughs> and thanks. So uh, it's, it's a great thing that happened from me raising this issue. And I made friends with the academic journal. Like, they didn't mean harm. It's, these things happen unintentionally, and I understand. But, you know, they're trying to improve and change. But, you know, the trauma that I experienced from this is still sort of making me feel uneasy to raise a question. And I'm an artist. And I want to be vocal. I want to raise questions. And I shouldn't feel this way. But the trauma, the trauma. And of course, I should learn to cope with this. But you know, I'm not an emotionless robot. And I feel that by the time I learn to become this artist in a social media age, I will become a different person. You know, Because it's natural to be hurt by someone making a terrible comment about yourself. So yes, you know, the radical futures definitely created this utopic world of spreading ideas and spreading discussions. But you know, at the same time, it's forcing artists to be in this sort of situation where she has to handle these terrible comments thrown at her. And I don't have the answer to this. And I don't know what's the solution. But whatever the outcome of this theoretical future is, well, I'm certain that the way artists operate and spread ideas and question is definitely changing in the 2010s and it's definitely going to evolve. And I would love to talk more about this in the Q&A session too. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you. <laughs> much Putniko and I think you just ended with this very interesting an anecdote and some so many questions actually uh, about afterglow and about how you can survive as a, as a woman as an artist but you're so many things actually you're a professor you're an artist and I think what you're doing is, is really uh, very complex and, and, and really amazing and I think uh, I just want to maybe uh, start with one one question, and then we can open up to the audience. Um, I mean, I think what when I heard about your the incident, and I think maybe a lot of people have this on their mind right now. Was this? Do you think this is more like a Japanese issue, or maybe to put it in a in a different way, like when uh, the international media were picking up on it? How how did they put it? Did they see it as a, a global issue? This issue of uh, scientific fields still being sexist. Uh, basically, I think it, the academics were quick to realize, you know, that there was an issue. But then some people were, you know, making comments that, you know, I, 
to get, so, you know, I'm sort of on the side of the West to get more support uh, to change the Japanese ways. And um, so I was getting criticized for, because I didn't tell the BBC News to make an article about it, but, you know, oh, Sputniko is on the West side. So there are some strange comments like that. But um, I think also um, it's very, it's very sort of, you often see imagery like this in uh, Japanese pop culture, like maids or quite ma maid cafes, sexualized images. And in a way, it's part of the culture. And I think, I, you know, I'm quite, personally, I'm open to this because this is Japanese culture. But as an academic journal, having this on the front cover, it kind of restricts what female scientists can do in uh, Japanese academia. I thought it's, that's very inappropriate, so I raised the question. But, um, yeah. So have you ever seen something like that in, in, in Western culture, this kind of sexism? Or because okay. you, you are a mathematician. I mean, you have yeah. actually operated in many sort of quote-unquote male domains. So mm -hmm. have you, do you see it everywhere? And do you, are you alert to this kind of... Uh, I think... It, it just, it happens a lot, you know, but, you know, like, girls uh, not into engineering or science, that kind of conception, kind of, it's changing, but it's sort of in the air a little bit, you know. If you go to the toy section, the Le Legos and the Boyd's toys and the Barbies and the girl toy, that still happens. But um, I think, especially Europe, there's more, I feel that European people are more conscious of this gender issue compared to um, Japan. So because I'm half British, half Japanese, and I'm be in between two cultures, I always, I always feel the difference and uh, I always feel uneasy when I see something in Japan that no one sees a problem with and I raise you know, an opinion and I get attacked and it just feels a bit strange, but that, I'm used to it now, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just wonder if the audience wants to pick up and add to the discussion here. Ah, there we go. Uh, there's a mic right there, I think. Hello, I already complimented you on your fabulous outfit, which I hope <laughs> everyone noticed. Um, so I'm from the United States, and my entire career has been about feminist media. So to see something like this, I'm blown away. Thank I have you. never seen this type of work before, and it gives me complete hope for the future. I'm going to tell everybody that I know about you know, what you're doing, and you're going to have so many more fans. I think Thank you. <laughs> one of the biggest things is that you just don't have any role models, or you don't see mm -hmm. that. And, you know, a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs, and they're in the public space as well. And the cyber bullying and death threats, it's a constant issue. So, um, you know, whether it's Western or Eastern cultures, it doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. all over. It's in every single, you know, fabric of society. Um, and really, I just wanted to say, you know, keep doing what you're doing and um, keep talking about the issues that you face. Because I think one of the biggest things is the issues keep trying to get pushed under the rug and keep people silent. And that is not what needs to happen. You need to keep doing it. Keep being fun. Keep being empowering. And don't read that shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. It's just so much learning experience for me. Like, even now, I'm probably much better than some artists because I'm so into social media, but still, I have to always learn to get the heart of steel. So, but yeah, yeah I'm going to take your advice. And thank you so much. <laughs> do, do, do. Ah, there, yeah. Um, I also just want to congratulate you on just an amazing body of work for a young artist and I had a couple of comments and questions so one has to do I guess with the cyber bullying which you know you framed in a in the context of being an artist and being attacked and it being a surprise but I think you know this is an issue that has been uh, a struggle for cyber feminists for many years now and, and I think you know there is the kind of quip that is like the response that one should do at this point which is you know do not feed the trolls right this is the the kind of internet hacker uh, and sort of 4chan culture, which is, you know, one of provocation and, and trolling. 
Um, and I know that you know, Bitch Magazine had an, um, an issue sort of devoted to this question and, and how does one respond as a feminist in, in these contexts. Um, and it may be interesting for you, but also for, your, you know, for students at the, at the Media Lab. Um, the question I have really has to do with the nature of your work as sort of high pop culture, right? And, and your, your work is almost indistinguishable from other mass media products, right? Except that there's this, this kind of edge, you know, with the, with the kind of work from uh, science, technology, and engineering, and the, the kind of direct, you know, feminism. I guess the question I would have is like, in a, in a kind of media landscape where the, the, the sophistication and the polish of your images might be indistinguishable from, say, the, the newest Britney Spears video, how do you distinguish your, your artistic vision, your feminism from the kind of mass mediated or manufactured um, Britney Spears mm -hmm. feminism or, or, or images? Does that make sense? Yes, it does, okay. yeah. So when I moved to Japan in 2010 after graduating from Royal College of Art, I, some of my friends were telling me, you know, it's harder for young artists to get sponsorship grants in Japan compared to Europe. Europe, there's a very, you know, culture of giving grants. So like my friends were, why are you going to Japan? But Japan was an interesting country for me because it had this very diverse, rich pop culture that could even almost contain a work that almost sits in a high art context. So I thought, Japan, I'm going to hack Japan, Japanese pop culture. And Japanese media is full of these stupid little girls in bikini going, yeah, I'm stupid. So I'm going to inject something different in this. So I went in there and I really intentionally used this cheesy pop language. Even videos, music, I get, uh, I used to write all my songs, now I work with a, a writer who writes for like pop idols in Japan. <laughs> but I make everything super sleek, but if you really look at it, what it's talking about is a bit, you know, different. And this is my way of working is, rather than criticizing the current system, I would play within the current system to get progressive, different ideas. So I would go inside the system and break it apart. That's my vision. So that's how I work and that's how I like to distinguish myself from Justin Bieber and Britney Spears. I have a different intention. So recently I published a book in Japan and about 40,000 copies went in bookstores and I wrote, I don't, I don't know if you have a lot of these, they're these books for teenagers, you know, how to be a, a good adult kind of thing, you know, how to go through your high school life. Well, I wrote a Sputniko version of this <laughs> and, you know, I made it very sort of cheesy, the cover is me going like, how to be a great adult, you know, how to not listen to, so Japan has a very rigid society rules, you know, and it's, it's a culture to listen to the elders and follow the rules, I think more so than Europe. But in the book I'm writing, you know, you can question these rules and you could question the system and if you think something is not working out right in your environment, look outside, look elsewhere because maybe there's a better world for you, you know you're not stuck in just one small place. So I wrote a book and it's, it, it's really selling well and I'm getting feedback from 13 year olds, 15 year olds, college students on Twitter saying how they read this book and they were inspired. And this really means a lot to me because I feel like children, young people are really the future. So by sort of having my works seen by them and inspiring the children, maybe more change, more, more minds would change and more transformation will happen. So that's, that's how I work and I'm very intentional about that too. I hope that, that answers the question. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, maybe I can follow up yeah. and maybe you can all think of another question okay. meanwhile. <laughs> um, I think it, the, uh, it's amazing the way you really care about youth and young people and um, 
I see that, like, you know, in sort of thinking about all the work you've shown, there's this little girl, and she's very familiar with new technologies and cyber culture, and, but it, that's, that's really wonderful, of course, but it's also the fantasy, right? It's the, uh, you know, the desire to live in fantasies and then to build technologies and tools that can, uh, you know, make these dreams come true. That all sounds very simplistic, but you actually take it quite seriously. And since you are also an engineer, you can actually even do these things. And it's just totally amazing. And then you also want to share this with young people. Uh, that's my question. How do you do that? How do you educate people, like, for instance, in, in your job? Uh, how do you educate younger people to have this, the scope, which is enormous, actually, I think? Um, yes, um, because I just moved to MIT, so I haven't actually been inter interacting with students there yeah. properly yet, but I did some workshops in Japanese universities. And I like working with them. Also, like, I'm, I'm 28 at the moment, so I started doing workshops when I was 25, and my, I'm not that different with them in age. I feel kind of like we're on the same plane. And I, I like to, when I work with them, I like to almost provoke them to, and I don't want them to think I'm the teacher and I teach them. I want to have an environment where we're, we're all thinking together, you know, and if they think what I'm saying is a bit weird, then they're, they're free to question me. They're, it's a very interactive, and I think that really motivates the students a lot for them to think that like I'm thinking with them, you know, I'm questioning with them. So it's, yeah, that's how I work. And also I think, I don't know, some, some kids have a feeling, especially in Japan, maybe here too, it's like, you know, critical thinking or, you know, being sort of questioning about the world has a more darker connotation, like darker image, mm -hmm. not so much happy, positive thing. So uh, I kind of like to present it in a very positive way. You know, it's not something gloomy, it's something positive and it changes the world in a good way. So I like to sort of keep a smile and sort of... Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with language, actually, with how you express critical ideas, because you, you make these amazing music videos, and I think it's a very interesting way of, of thinking about mm -hmm. knowledge. But, I mean, it makes me think one more time how awkward academic language is, actually. Uh, especially also again for young people or for other cultures too, mm -hmm. for different, for diverse cultures. Uh, and so I do think it's like a way forward. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just positive or optimistic, it's just a kind of stylistic change, stylistic mm -hmm. revolution perhaps. Um, and one that could probably, you know, have some problems, of course, but I think it's, it's going there, maybe. Yeah, for me, because I was in Japan for three years doing all this sort of pop-related work, suddenly to go to MIT Media Lab, and <laughs> MIT Media Lab, of course, is a very open place for an academic institution, but still, it's a big culture shock for me, so because I'm used to speaking in this language of pop, now I'm surrounded by professors and, uh, you know, doing completely different research, and it's a culture shock, but it's exciting, and I'm so happy that MIT Media Lab is so open-minded that, you know, they decided they wanted to ha have me join as a faculty and no one knows what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but um, I hope it's going to be an exciting journey there too. I'm sure it will be. <laughs> and I'm so glad they hired you with the menstruation machine. I hope. <laughs> the, oh, the question there. Yeah, actually the question you just answered, <laughs> but maybe you can elaborate a bit on that because I yes. was oh, curious. Yeah. I am here. Yes, you are. Yeah, I was uh, actually curious to understand how it works now at the MIT because we also know that you know the MIT has uh, pretty also strong uh, uh, technology background and also I think it's kind of male dominated. So I was really wondering uh, what is the reaction on uh, your works in that context and also if you have future projects you want to take. I mean you answered a bit already, but uh, I don't know. Maybe you have something to add on that. 
I think the reactions has, has been really open, positive at Media Lab, which is nice. It's, it's a great place and it's so stimulating. And also because there's so much uh, innovation happening around, it, it feels to me like you know, there's so many stories that spring up in my mind. I would talk to people, I would see someone's research, and a character comes out, and a story comes out, music comes out. So it's a great place for me to be and really think about what the future could be and talk about them. So it's a great environment that way. So I'm pretty sure my future projects, I'll be working a lot with people at MIT, or maybe Harvard, because it's really close by. And uh, yeah, so right now I'm in the thinking phase, because I just finished the moonwalk machine. So right now I'm sort of looking around, thinking, reading, trying to pick up uh, different interests. But at the moment, this is completely unrelated to MIT, but I have this really strong interest in uh, cats on Roombas. <laughs> I feel cats are like the queen of the internet at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> cats are everywhere on the internet. The cats are ruling communication and uh, interaction, affection. And I thought, and I, I can't stop looking at cats on Roombas. And I'm, I'm really curious to really explore what cat means on the internet communication. And maybe actually do a project on cats, I don't know, or featuring cats. You know, if, I, if all the characters are cats, maybe I'm going to get more views and have a more popular audience, I don't know. So, like, but my ideas spring out from something absolutely ridiculous like that. But that's how my projects start out, like cats. Roombas, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, some other questions from the audience? Yeah, I yeah. hear you, yeah, but yeah, I don't there see out there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I make research about science art, and a lot of times I, I send the message that science has no um, nationality and the more gender, but you signed a lot that you are a female scientist. Could you please explain your position? Oh, sorry, I didn't understand the question very well. Sorry, sorry, missionality. Okay, yeah. you, you told a lot of times that you are a female scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean for you? Why uh, do you sign that you are a female scientist, not just a scientist? Because, uh -huh. yeah. Actually, I don't particularly feel that I'm a female scientist. Actually, I did use the word a lot when I'm giving a talk, how would, how would female scientists feel when the, the image on the academic journal. I guess when, if I, because I don't feel that I'm a female scientist, if I rephrase the question as maybe like an artist and maybe a female artist with interests in science and engineering, I think when I make works, it's kind of natural for me to make works out of the questions I get in everyday life. And because I grew up, you know, being a girl interested in maths and science and seeing sort of different problems and thinking a lot about menstruation or pregnancy, biological functions of a woman, it's quite natural for me to bring up those topics in my works. But I don't think you know, especially in science, I don't think female scientist work is different from a male scientist work. I think they all, it's different for everyone, you know, they all produce their own work, so I don't feel that. But as an artist, I do, I do have a tendency to bring up those questions, but I don't want to confine my question to just that, because I think that's just such a waste, there's so many questions to ask. But yes, that's... That's my natural tendency as an artist with an interest in science. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Uh, and could I ask one more? Um, the first project is quite provocative, quite, mm -hmm. uh, just a bit. And um, could you please tell me, is there any border for you uh, mm, to make a project so uh, about um, some kind of, okay, this topic I will not touch because mm. of the, moral, the, moral, the morality things or that stuff? 
what's your limit? It's an interesting question because it's very, it's, it's an interesting question because sometimes I would be talking with scientists or specialists and I would come up with an idea which is very provocative, but you know, what, what if these scientists are going to be very hurt from this question? You know, they're good hearts of scientists working on their research and if I portray a world that shows, uh, you know, a bad, almost a negative image of their research, what are they going to think? And it's so difficult because I'm building a friendship relationship with them. And yeah, I do admit that I get some questions that I'm, I decided, okay, I, I can't ask this now. So it's, it's always difficult and I think I like to always feel that um, I think it, it's so difficult. I want to be a nice person. I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. But then I want to ask important questions too. So it's always a seesaw balance. But um, I always feel this is me, but I, I want to be I, I want to be a good-hearted person first, and then an artist second, because for me, social media, it's so important to work with people, get support and discussion with people that it's really important for me to really connect with people. So that really affects my decision too, and it's, it's difficult, and I don't know the answer, like where's the borderline? It's every time I'm thinking, like, should I ask this? No. But if it's something that I feel is very important, I think I'll ask. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Is there any other question? No? Okay, I think then we can uh, end the presentation, the, okay. key, the last keynote of the Transmediale Festival. Uh, thank you so much, Putnik. It was thank very energizing. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much for this really great uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it and I really wish you the best for your future and career and uh, everything. And also thank you, Catherine. Uh, now I would like also to uh, force uh, uh, say thanks to you and also call on stage Christopher Gansin, the artistic director of Transmediale, that would like to give a final statement also to, uh, you know, greet everybody and uh, close the conference program. Wow. Hey, hey. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Tatiana, and thanks to Catherine and to Sputniko for this wonderful presentation and conversation. Unfortunately, the flowers are not for you, Sputniko, uh, or you, Catherine. I will reveal the secret of these flowers very shortly. But um, first, um, it, was, it was kind of suggested, I don't know how it came to be, that I would make some closing statement on the Afterglow conference and festival. I think that would amount to megalomaniac pretentiousness, so I will refrain from, from trying to sum up the very compressed experience that we had during these four days, but I can hope that, I mean, Transmediale is just like a node in ongoing discussions anyway, and we will follow up on these in our all-year events and on the next festival, and I hope to, to see all of you and many more that are not here right now, again next year. Um, but what I would really like to do is to thank people, to thank you as an audience, to thank, of course, all the participants that have made this amazing program uh, possible, um, and our team to, uh, well, I mean, you can only imagine what hard labor goes into making this festival possible, all our project managers, administrative team, the technical crew, the interns, the volunteers, um, and not the least, of course, uh, the curators, uh, my fellow curators, uh, Marcel Schwerin, who is probably working hard right now down in the uh, screening room with probably still a Q&A going on there with Luther Price. But also, of course, Tatjana. So, Tatjana Batsikelli. So, she is the 
conference curator of Transmediale. She is also a very important person in the whole thematic development of the festival and she has been working for the past three years with our all-year program that I started also at the same time as Tatjana and I asked her to develop this uh, resource for transmedial culture which is an all-year networking uh, program of Transmediale that connects with different spaces and projects here in Berlin. And um, a lot of the discussions that is, she's brought into the festival were quite new also, I think, for the Transmediale and, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the focus that you already mentioned on the sexuality and bodily discourses, but also the very, very uh, important stream this year of Hashes to Ashes, for example. And uh, she has decided to move on now from the Transmediale, actually, and try out, I think, also life as I don't know, actually, it will be freelance curating research, the activities that she has been doing with us and was also doing before in Berlin and abroad. And I, together with the rest of the team, would just like to thank Tatjana very much for these years together. It's not so dark, we will continue collaboration, but in what form, I don't know. We will definitely follow up on the tracks that we developed and that you developed with Transmediale in some way. But for now, uh, I would like to give you these flowers. And I also uh, ran down to the internet black market and picked up a certificate for you. So I will have a look what it is. It is a certificate of approval that I bought from DJ Detweiler, DJ Dad Magnet and Chinstroke Records. They have now promised to promote you. Uh, this is to certify that DJ Detweiler, DJ Dad Magnet, Chinstroke Records likes the curatorial work of Tatjana Batsikeli. <laughs> it will last for all time, asterisk at least a month or so. So, there you go. Certificate of approval. Please approve Tatjana Batskelly. Yeah. Oh, thanks you a lot. I think uh, actually, I think it's really promising to receive a certificate from the internet black market. Maybe that is really something to reflect for the future. <laughs> so I'm proud of that. And uh, yeah, of course, I also want to say thanks to you, Christopher, that brought me in this adventure and all the Transmediale team, and who knows what will come. For sure, there will be a lot of uh, the radical futures. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know, I didn't really prepare a statement, but uh, just say thanks for this festival and uh, for the great experience that for sure was really important for me. Thank you and enjoy the further afterglow of the afterglow. Thanks.